With Lululemon, the real gift happens when they're living in it. When you give them the coziest scuba matching set, the real gift is this. And this. And this. This holiday, Lululemon makes it easy to give a gift that goes beyond. Open the moment. Shop now at lululemon.com. Welcome to Kill Me Now with Judy Gold. I am your host, Judy Gold. That's right. And this week we have part two of my interview with the incredibly talented Miriam Shore, who is a movie star. And she did my podcast. So there you go. People like me. So much to talk to you about. I will talk more in my rant next week, but I had an amazing trip to Israel and it was eight days. It was a mission. We went with a wider bridge, which uh, promotes LGBTQ equality in Israel. And we went to, I, I got it. It was fantastic. We went to the LGBTQ centers. I just need to do this just to get this over with. Okay. Uh, We went to the LGBTQ centers in Jerusalem, in Haifa, and in Tel Aviv. We went to a shelter in Jerusalem. We met with this mother of a trans kid who's eight years old, who was fucking amazing, uh, Mindy Levine. I have so much to tell you in in the next podcast. Uh, The struggle there continues, and, you know, I learned, well, they told us that whatever happens here, like what's happening in Florida— goes right over there. It it's it's goes right to Israel and they're dealing with a lot of the same shit that we're dealing with. But it we went I was at the West Bank. I met we met with an Israeli and a Palestinian, a rabbi and a Palestinian man and it was just fascinating. They're trying to build peace by having this community center together where they meet and talk, talk about each other's lives. It it was just I was so fucking tired, though. I have to tell you, I, Elisa will be like, oh, we were late to every, um, you know, because we, we had breakfast at 7 and we left at 8. You know, I'm a comic. 7 a.m. to me is like probably like 4 o'clock in the morning to you or like 3.30 because some people get up at like 5, which I could never understand. I'm an early morning. I like to watch the sunrise. Not me baby. I like to watch the sunset and then go on from there. But that's just me. And that's my clock. Speaking of my clock, I am so fucking jet lagged. Both Elisa and I are so goddamn jet lagged. So then of course I had to look up the symptoms. And of course we have every single one of them except for diarrhea. And it's this weird feeling. They say it takes for each hour you you know difference it takes a day so that means un, i won't be better until thursday so i got two more days people but you know just feeling a little off good thing the appetite is not big during the jet lag i just want to sleep so that's good but yeah i'm really jet lagged i did i was here when we found out that Orange Fuckface is being indicted. So that was fucking awesome. That was awesome. I still don't believe that he's going to jail, but he damn well should. And these Republicans should be ashamed of themselves. And, you know, this constant comparing to Hillary Clinton did this. Hillary Clinton wasn't president. Okay? She was not the president. She didn't take these documents. I mean... Cut the shit. These Republicans, I, I'm I'm not saying all of them, but the MAGA Republicans, anyone who defends him is really a spineless, racist, psychotic. Yeah, that I he's a traitor. I can't fucking believe this is whatever. 
And he's got like 60 something percent of the like they're going to vote for him. These idiots. Yeah, I said idiots because they're idiots. Such a fuck up, oh, whatever. So, um, all right. So that's that. I'm back from Israel and Trump got indicted. Oh, I hosted Montclair, New Jersey Pride on Saturday and it was so much fun. It was exhausting. Yes, I'm exhausted. I'm going to say the word exhausted a lot. So too bad. But it was, there were over 20,000 people there, which was their biggest one yet. And it is the biggest gay pride in New Jersey. So I, you know, I hosted, so I worked from about 12 till seven. I got there around 11, 15, but yeah, I wasn't, didn't start working till around noon. You know, the bagels in New Jersey are very good. I stopped and got a bagel. I had a craving. I love pumpernickel, pumpernickel with scallion cream cheese. Yeah. So I was up and down. I got a lot of steps in. Uh, but there were so many incredibly talented people there. I did a, uh, I did a little skit with Laura uh, Benati, who is, you know, she plays Melania on The Late Show with Stephen Colbert, and so she did Melania. She was Melania, and we did a little skit. And she's just so fucking talented. She's on Amy Schumer's uh, show. She's just so fucking talented and so nice and such an ally. Uh, to the LGBTQ plus community. So that was really, really fun and exhausting. Um, oh, and I saw podcast guests, Liz Glazer there. She just had a baby, Mazel Tov, with her wife, Karen. And uh, John Fish, a uh, brilliant comedian. Uh, he was there with his partner, Lee, and their two beautiful children. And yeah, it was it was... You know, pride is important now because of what's going on, and we should just continue to a- attack LGBTQ plus people since they have such a major effect on your lives and your kids' lives, you motherfuckers. Watch the Tonys. Tonys. First of all, this is what I was thinking during the Tonys. I thought first the, the these people are so fucking talented. They had no writers, and they pulled that off. So well. So then it made me think, A, they're so fucking talented, they don't need writers because they're just so talented. They can just sing and dance and they don't have to talk. And then I thought, oh God, now people are going to be like, you know, the the Tony Awards were so good without the writers. Why should we pay writers? I That's what I kept thinking that they're going to do. And, you know, the writers, I'm in the Writers Guild. It's really not fair we just want to be paid fairly and treated fairly. And yeah, it's, I'm going to go pick it again. Picketing was fun. It wasn't fun. I mean, it was fun. Yeah, it was fun. So there was that. And then two non-binary actors won for best actor in a play, best actor in a musical, which was, I think that's what it was, but I could be lying. But yeah, this is, it's just like a fuck you to these people who are targeting us because they have, you know, they're losing power and, you know, this way they can, you know, divert from guns and kids being killed all the time. It's really just a diversion tactic. So go fuck yourselves. Um, but, you know, being in Israel and seeing what they're going through you know, first they're scared for their lives. We marched in the Jerusalem Day uh, Pride Parade, which was a political statement, and there there's no people on the side. It was just you know cheering us along. It was security, and there were kids on a roof that were giving us the finger. Kids, and you know what? That there are also people on their balconies who were cheering us and had had uh, pride flags. So, uh, but it was the largest uh, pride march in Jerusalem's history. And it was the whole trip, even though I hate this word, it was very impactful. Check out a wider bridge. They're an incredible organization. I'm going to tell you all about it on the next episode, but we met so many people from around the country who, you know, allies, very diverse group of people went on this mission and it definitely changed me and Annalisa 
and uh, I brought my CPAP machine on the plane because I wanted Elisa to be able to sleep, but I felt, you know, it's just like, it's so big and the, the mini ones are so expensive, but yeah. So I had my CPAP machine in Israel, so I didn't snore. So I did not snore in Israel except for one night when I pulled it out. And then Elisa was like, you were snoring. I'm like, well, just wake me up because the fucking CPAP machine is right here. I just pulled it out because it was hurting my nostril. Okay. Uh, so that's that. Yeah, lots lots to talk about. But, you know, I interviewed Miriam before I left, and she's just so fantastic. So I hope you enjoy part two of my interview with the incredible uh, Miriam Shore. I want you to sit back. I want you to relax. And I want you to enjoy yourselves as I speak with Miriam Shore. I want to ask you, you know, you played Yitzchak in, and I know I've watched interviews with you and they don't know how to say Yitzchak, okay? They say Yitzchak. You played Yitzchak and, wait, I got to ring the bell a few times. Well, for all this bit that came out, you ring the bell. Yeah, thank you. I got to do both. At that time, you were playing a, a man. You were, you looked really good, by the way, I have to say. But I think I'm a hot guy. You are. You're a hot guy. I have played multiple roles as a woman disguised as a man. And since I'm so tall, I would be on set. And when someone said that's actually a woman, the people would be like, no, it's not. I swear to God. But I did Shakespeare in the Park and I did the all female Taming of the Shrew. Oh. And we I played a man. Love it. And it was I mean, trans men get this. I mean, I, I had an assistant who transitioned and he told me like the way people treat him and the entitlement, like he was blown away after he had top surgery and really and got some facial hair. The difference in the way people treated him. Yeah. Well, when we did it, it was the late 90s. And I mean, you know, trans rights. Right. We're nowhere. They're still, we still need a, we have a lot of fight yeah, ahead of us. But, you know, it wasn't the yeah. thing you would say, you know what I mean? And and what we were dealing with, John Cameron Mitchell, who wrote it with Stephen Trask, the reason he wanted a, a woman to play Yitzhak, who right. is a man, not a trans right. man at the time, just to, you know, was in order to really explore right. gender, explore the binary, explore identity. And, and that's sort of what this, right. the show is about. And now I think it's a, Fantastic show, that's in, for sure. But I think it's a show that has a, enough scaffolding to hold any new thing you put on it. So now we've evolved. The conversation has evolved quite a bit. And we can add all kinds of things about gender identity onto it that we just right. didn't have the but language for in the same way at the time. Yeah. No, I was just going to say, you know, you did that then. It was way ahead of its time. Now I feel like there would be a backlash. Why is why is she playing him? Why can't you get a non-binary? You know, this is what's happening now. Like I will never get another part as a woman disguised as a man. I, I, I'm not sure though, actually. I'm gonna push back on that a little because I, I wasn't playing a right, trans right. man. I was playing a man. It was a man, a cisgendered man. And uh, it just so happened that an actress was playing. And I think there is a, a wonderful opportunity to have Yitzhak being played by a trans man or non-binary or end or anything. I think that could, that it absolutely can hold that. And same with, same with uh, uh, any of the characters in, in the show. Uh, at the time, that wasn't what we were doing, but I thought it was really valuable what we were doing, which was really just sort of it was really valuable for me. I thought it was yeah, valuable for society and the art of world course. as well and the theater world. But for me, to, sit, to sort of be able to question identity, gender identity, what that means to me, I, I felt like, wow, everyone needs to walk through the uh, world uh, as a different gender for a bit to understand, to just open up, to just understand what, what it does to you because you're treated differently, that you yep. view yourself differently. I know that there's there's conversations around it. I'm not really afraid Same. of those conversations. I welcome those conversations. Well, because we know we're on the uh, right side of history. Um, like, we welcome it because we know we're on the right side. It's the people who are so resistant that don't welcome the conversation. 
Right. It's so interesting to me who, where when there are people who are just, I remember I was at a GLAD. Yeah. I was at GLAD, you know, the GLAD Awards, and it was wonderful. And Chaz Bono was giving an award or was up there. And, and, and a person who was sitting next to me, a gay man, was like, I don't get it. And I was like, what? What do you mean? I don't, you don't get what I told you. I didn't understand what he was talking about. It was like, I just don't get the trans thing. And I was like, first of all, right, right. Don't pull like, me I'm aside. Like, I side. Have, yeah. What? I'm just like, I, it doesn't right. really matter if you get. He's still there. So you getting it or not getting it actually is not relevant at all. But it's right. we're all having this learning experience. And I think yeah. been a part of Hedvig at that time opened me up in a way that a lot of yeah, people didn't have. Yeah, that's what I want. That's what I was trying to I can see that you sort of were given a gift right there as a straight woman. Yeah. It's so interesting, too, because... People get so angry if you change your definitions. And I'm like, well, isn't that really up to a person to decide for themselves? Isn't that the conversation we're having right when now? You, like, when a lot of straight people get married, they take, they change their name. They change their name and no one has a fucking problem with that. And when a trans person changes their name, it's like a big fucking problem. I it's so, so I don't understand that. I'm like, it doesn't make sense to me. I'm like, there's so many... I'm so oh, tired. Please. There's so many other things that we need to fight. The nitpicking and the, and it's their obsession with genitalia. It's ridiculous. That's it's all so fascinating. Yeah. I just think fear is so powerful. It, it really is. It's so powerful. I mean, that's why we can't throw our shit out. There's some fear in us not throwing our shit out. No, right. right? You've done so much television. I, I can't even, but younger, younger was a big thing for you. It was a big thing because it was filmed in New York and it ran for uh, many, many seasons. So I mean, just that. It's the, like the, uh, you won, right? won yeah. the fucking lottery. And I was fully aware of it and grateful and continue to be grateful for that. Like, uh, you know, I just want to be a working actor. I, like, I don't, I don't need fame and fortune. I mean, I'll, I'll take, I'll take fortune. If you will, if you're giving it, I'll take it. But I want fortune and respect from my peers. That's all I want. That's what we Isn't all want. I think we're, that's the goal. The fame thing, I don't quite understand. No, there's people who I don't, who really want the fame. I know, I mean, I'm a comedian. I know a lot of people who just want that fame. And I would rather never worry about money again and have you know, other people in my industry and other people, period, to respect the work that I do. That's it. That's all I want. I know. Um, and that to me affords me a little bit of like, I want to live in New York. I'm a New Yorker. I want, my kids are New Yorkers. My family, like, it's just where I want to be. I, right, I feel a little unmoored. Uh, I didn't want to move my family back and forth because yeah. we know I had that experience. That's not really what I'm, what I'm feeling for my own family. And uh, I just like living in New York. I feel, um, I don't feel like myself so much over in LA. Oh, uh, I can have a good time, but I just feel up, not grounded, literally. It's also that, you know, I moved back from New York, back to New York when my ex was pregnant with Henry. And because I, wa I knew I wanted to bring my kid up here. And my agents and managers were so pissed off at me because I was really on a roll. But I was like, I'm only here because of my job. Uh, which I know a lot of people move for their job, but I can do my job here and my and raise my family here. And of course, I'm sure, you know, they were so mad at me. They're like, you're on a roll. And I'm like, mm, just not I'm not as important as the kid. You know, I, I, I made some stupid, but I I don't think they're stupid now. But yeah, you have to have your priority set. Mine was to be in New York. And then I got that job. I feel you completely. It's just kind of how we, we wanted to do it as a family. And and it allowed me to do that. And then on top right. of that, I worked with a fantastic cast and writers and crew. And then uh, I got to play this really fun character. I, that's, I was going right into this. Like, I got to play a total cunt on um, City on a Hill. And it was, it's so fun. It, to yeah. have the agency to speak your mind is what's the most fun about it. Right. Right. Because I really do care what people think about me. I would love to walk through the world and be like, I don't care what anybody thinks about me. So right. I can say that, but it is not 
Like I do right. care what people think about me. Yeah. Um, too much probably. But also I want to be kind. I don't want to hurt people's feelings. You know, I'm, I'm an empath in that. Like I just really care what people Same. feel when I, when yeah. I interact with one. So, you know, I don't have that kind of agency, but it's a safe space to get to play that part. And it's so fun. It's so, so fun. Uh, they also made her smart. Yeah. You know, uh, she, there, she's definitely insecure. All of the foibles and the comedy comes from her deep, deep rooted insecurities rather than her, her stupidity. She's always smart. She's just blinded by her own insecurities. And that's why she makes really asinine choices when she does and creates comedy. But, um, but you know, to be able to play that. Also, I like playing people who I learned from it, you know, because there's times where she would do things and I'd be like, why does she feel such agency? And I don't, right? you know, or so confident about her actual abilities. But I was like, why am I so namby pandy about that? Yeah, like, why yeah. can't I be like, I don't deserve to be in this room and I deserve to be hurt. Right. Why can't I say that? Right. And, and it, your body gets used to it. So then you, fi- then you find yourself in a situation in your real life and you're like, oh, I think I'll just be her. I would do that with Yitzhak too because I felt physically powerful as Yitzhak. Yeah, you you take up more space. You feel like you can take up more space. Yeah, and so I would just like get there physically and it would change my feelings around things. So, you know, it's fun as actors, as performers that we get to experience that. And exp- you know, yeah, that's- and the exploration definitely makes you smarter. This week's episode of It's Judy Show with Judy Gold is sponsored by BetterHelp. And if you know me, which I think you do because you're listening to my podcast right now, you know that I am a big advocate for therapy. I think it benefits everyone. I think there's so many people who need it, who don't partake. It is so important for your emotional health and well-being. Therapy is fantastic. It is in every stretch of the imagination. And if you're thinking of starting therapy, please do it. But please give BetterHelp a try. It is entirely online. It's designed to be convenient. It's flexible. It suits your schedule. You fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist, and you can switch therapists anytime for no additional charge. I have switched therapists in my life. I've had many, many therapists and you know, sometimes it's not a great fit for you, but don't give up. Therapy is beneficial. You can learn about yourself. You can process and just be emotionally healthy. I'm telling you, do it. Better help is great because, you know, when I used to schlep to my therapist's office, it was so annoying. You have to do it and you sit there and you wait and then... It, I'm telling you, doing it online is fantastic. And BetterHelp is amazing. I know a lot of people have used it. So if you're thinking about therapy, go to BetterHelp.com. Let the gratitude flow. This is gratitude month, people. So you need to let the gratitude flow with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash Judy Gold, J-U-D-Y-G-O-L-D, today and you will get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash Judy Gold. You're welcome. It's so funny when we did Shakespeare in the Park and I was playing a guy, we had a uh, a choreographer, a, a body movement person who taught us, they're like, yeah. you're not playing a guy, you are a guy. And they taught us how to walk, h- how they, how their bodies move. It was really interesting. I remember doing that when I was, it's like, I didn't have, we didn't, we didn't have a budget. We were like workshop yeah. time. It was just us. Like, but I do remember thinking, okay, well, what, I, what are the men or the boys or the guys in my life that I, that I can like think of that remind me of this person? There was one guy in high school who was like super like metal head guy and he would wear the bandana and the boots and I remember how he walked down the hallway in high school and he was pretty threatening but deep yeah. down you knew he was just like hurting 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 yeah, yeah. and he wanted to be like oh, what happened to you and I remember like I would follow people in New York whose body movements I was like oh that's interesting I want to what yeah. is that I want to and I would like walk behind him like a creepy stalker yeah, lady yeah, yeah, yeah. and just kind of like physicality um and it and you're like wow I feel different I love just that. walking through the world it's so fun yeah. Uh, and you learn, you learn too. Then you're like, 
well, why do I walk through the world the way I walk? What am I hiding? What am I, what am I protecting? You know, and it's the same thing that you were saying with Diana Trout is that like, wait, how was she able to do that? And I can't. Yeah. And that's and the armor she yeah. wears. Well, she literally, some of the jewelry I wore on that show. Oh was, my I God, think, those necklaces. Arm- yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like a, that was used in jousting, but now she's wearing it as a necklace. Yes. Um, that's not how heavy it was too. No, and I and and just the way you know it's so funny too because some people who know me from that show are like, oh, you're you know, fashion matters to you, and you're 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 this kind of woman, and you, you see me in my life where I'm just covered in schmutz all the time yeah. and like wearing as much as I can, just gross. I'm just what yeah. I'm saying is I'm gross. I'm gross too. We should just get together and be gross together on the Upper West Side. <laughs> but there are women in the world to do that. There right. are women in the world wake up and prepare for battle like yes and god bless them because man i don't have the energy wow no way i'm trying to get the fucking audience to laugh at my stupid jokes well okay look now i know you're supposed we're on the podcast you're supposed to ask me questions but i was thinking about like i just think you're great and i was thinking about stand-up comedy and i mean a lot of friends friends and standing up and doing stand-up comedy is just its own thing it is not a performance like any other kind and it was one that I've always been afraid of. I have many friends who've done it to great success or varying degrees, but to some to great success. And I used to do sketch comedy in that world, the underground comedy world in the 90s, which was super yeah. fun. Loved it. Yeah, it was amazing. It was fun. It was crazy. But that particular nakedness of being a stand-up comedian, I was like, yeah, no, no way. That's a fight. I'm like, I put down the weapons and I'm like, well, forfeit? when you're ready... When you're ready, my son, Henry, uh, helped create this uh, all-female open mic night. It's every Sunday at like five in the afternoon on the Upper West Side. And if you're ready, it's the sa- it, it's a safe place to try. I mean, just so you have that experience. That's literally because because in terms of the what I what I like to do is I like to create a character. I and and obviously right. you can do that as stand up. A lot a lot of stand up comedians have yeah. they're like they're not the people that they are when they do their stand up. Um, but, but I also, uh, it's lonely. It's lonely. It's lonely and it's lonely on the road and it's lonely when you're done. I want all the, I want the gang. Yeah. It's so, it's so different. Like, uh, we get off stage, everyone loves us, hopefully. And then you're alone and it's, it's really, it's, and you go back to the hotel and when you're a woman, you're really alone. I met, I came, I started this with you. I was talking to a friend who had seen your show and thought you were fantastic. And I was like, I know we were kidding about it. And I was like, the strength and fortitude of a, sta- a female stand up comedian, period, end of sentence. But the strength and fortitude of a female stand up comedian in the 80s, 90s, that's a different, that yeah. was a whole different ball game. Yeah. I just had lunch with Carol Leifer and we were talking about how fucking different it was. Thank God. I mean, thank God there are these young women who are doing stand up now that and I and, and young people of all kinds and older people who are now starting yeah. to start out when they're a little bit old, which I love. And I'm like here for in every possible way. Yeah. Someone who's 15 is like fucking stand up comedian yeah. now and they're great. Yes, I love it. I, I, it's so fun to see the agency that people have now. People who didn't weren't allowed to have right, the agency right. back then. And we're just grabbing it and taking and that like, mic yeah. and not and being fearless. Yeah, I, I really, I know we don't have a lot of time left and I really want to talk about this. You are in a film that's coming out called Maestro, uh, which is based on Leonard Bernstein and who I have the best story about, um, Scorsese, Spielberg, Todd Phillips, Bradley Cooper, and uh, Scorsese was going to direct it. And then he did the Irishman. So Bradley Cooper directed it. You play Cynthia O'Neill, who was very close to Felicia um, Berns- Bernstein's wife, Ber- and Bernstein. Berns- I get always get yelled at. And I've loved Leonard Bernstein from when I was a little kid. When he, uh, yeah, you know. and he made he made that music accessible to young people. That was his goal. Uh, that was his. Yeah, he had the young people's concerts. Uh, wait, can I just tell my one Leonard Bernstein story? It was like 1980. Six, five, six. We're in, it was New Year's. It was either Christmas Eve or New Year's. And we went to the movies because we're Jews on, you know, and uh, and we went to the movie by Lincoln Center 
at the theater and um this guy comes in with another man and uh he's coughing a lot uh and he's sitting behind us and i say to my ex like oh my god oh my god it's leonard bernstein and then all of a sudden you know like 3 minutes later you know you know how they played music at the at the lincoln center theater and and so all of a sudden west side story comes on and like everyone who was in the audience waiting for the movie to start started laughing it was just the greatest you know he's sitting right there it's, it was such a New York moment. Imagine if you composed West Side Story. I don't know what I that would feel like. like what it's that amazing. Even? Amazing. Amazing. I don't even know. I mean, it uh, was to, really cool what to about be part to, of that. to con- conduct at the last minute. Like, and it's like a total star is born. Like, can you, can you fill in? Okay, now you're an icon. I was with Bradley when he was explaining this movie to someone and he was like, there was this composer named. And I was like, what? Why do you have to say that? And then I was like, oh, right. Because you do have to say that because not everybody knows who that person is. I mean, there's people in the world who don't know who Leonard Bernstein is and that's okay. And the, and he was talking about the movie Bradley was and he was so kind of humble about it because he does every single thing in the movie. I can't even like. Yeah. So I was being directed by Leonard Bernstein. So that was pretty right. Because <laughs> he was in the whole makeup and the, and he yeah. really inhabited it. It was oh, I shocking. Bet. I bet. It was very cool. It, it was very New York too, because there were a lot of great New York actors who were, we would have these group scenes. Like, because the Bernsteins would throw these fabulous parties with right. all these fabulous people. And you have these really great New York, real, you know, performers now playing these really cool New York people then. Right. In and like this he, was, moment. he was close with Aaron Copeland and like all these people, like I can't. These were his buddies. Yeah. Oh, they would go away for the week. I mean, okay. So I really wanted to talk to you about this. There's all this backlash because Bradley Cooper wore a prosthetic nose to play a Jew. Cause he's not a Jew. Jew, 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 Jew. Um, and now there's all these arguments about that, you know, and this came up at a, at a gig I did the other night at the Jewish Museum. I mean, it's called acting. So I think people can play other characters. But, you know, there's a lot of Jews that are like, well, couldn't this one play or th- that one play it? He has a big nose. Or does he have to have the big nose or the prosthetic nose? And it's such a... It's the same thing we were talking about in the beginning, where does a trans actor have to play that? Or, you know, we're getting into this slippery s- slope here. I mean, I think there's a slight, di- oh, well, I don't know. I don't think I have the authority to speak for the trans community. I do right, think that in a, in a show, I want to see trans actors playing it now of because course. I think they bring things that we now, we want us here. Now we're having this, so I want to see that. I don't Absolutely. want to exclude. I, I, you know, the makeup I saw him wear was intense age makeup. It wasn't to make him look Jewish. It was to yeah. make him look older. So I, I didn't, right. I don't have a sense that he like put on a big nose to look Jewish. So, you know, uh, that wasn't my experience. My experience was right. he was playing a character that he had researched and written because he wrote the script too. And yeah. it was directing in that it had trained like to learn to do all of the work so i you know i understand the conversations though and i'm again i'm not afraid of those conversations i think right people have opinions and people have discussions about it and i don't and i think they're all valuable because i think we're all trying to figure it out uh right what i participated in was really interesting and and I, I think it's going to be something unlike I, anybody's ever seen. So I think it will I, have a lot so of value. I'm so excited. Are, were, you must yeah. have been pinching yourself. I was. I mean, look, I, and I'm, I think we have, like, I have to, I have to shout, like, it wasn't the first time I worked with Bradley because I had just finished working on Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3, where Bradley. Okay. Guardians of Rock- the Galaxy, which you look cray cray in. It's so interesting that you're watching. Guardians of you're you're watching all the Guardians of the Galaxy with your kids over the pandemic and you get really into it. You get really, really into it. And then 
how long after you you finished watching it did you get the call? So Ruby, my 13 year old, is like, we're watching every single one of these movies in chronological order. Right. And I was like, we're sitting on the couch, doing nothing else. So I'm in. Let's do it. And we had these fantastic conversations around the mythology that has been created by the Marvel Universe that were deep, that were intense, that I want to have with right. my kids. So I was like, wow, look at look at what this can do. Right. right? It creates you discourse. Engage, Great art. Yeah. If you engage yeah. with your kids in the right people are very dismissive yeah. of it. And I understand points of view because they're worried that there's not space for other kinds of stories. Right, I understand. Right. But for us, for our family, like we talked about some really deep and important things uh, that because of that mythology that that world has, that universe has created. But two weeks after we finished watching the entire oeuvre in chronological order, I get a call saying, are you interested in Guardians of the Galaxy? And I was like, uh, interested. But wasn't that freaky? Don't you think that is so I, freaky? It's many. That's yeah. a word, right? Um, uh, yeah, it was. But you know what? It did feel like uh, like they were like, oh, you prepped for this exam? All right, let's see how you do. You know, and I just auditioned for it. Like, I'm just an actor. Right. No one's like, here's whatever, you know, I, uh, that's not how it works for me. I have to audition for stuff and whatever. I'm fine. That's what I do. But I, I felt pretty prepared. And I wasn't necessarily prepared for the enormity of the experience yeah, of being yeah, in a Marvel yeah. movie. Yeah. Which finished. But I'm a nerd. I love sci-fi. I love science fantasy. I love superhero stories and always have. It's part of what made me love what we yeah. do. So I, this is po- like COVID was tough for everybody, all of us on the planet. And to, to connect to that part of myself that cares about this stuff on a, on a really pure childlike right. level, to be able to connect to that. And this is what, why I love doing what I do and the play, the sense of play I had. Felt like such a gift anyway. And then for my kids to finally think I do something cool, forget it. The holidays are back at Starbucks and there's so much to share. With classics like caramel brulee latte, peppermint mocha, and chestnut praline latte, we're celebrating everyone's flavor of festivity. Order yours in the app. Is it weird to play a character that people, you know, can't recognize you from? Uh, is it much Love different it. than, you know, oh, that's so-and-so from blank or that's so, you know, that's, she was on Younger and she was, yeah. I was, they were talking about this a little bit earlier, which is like, I feel like every role I ever play, whoever sees me in that capacity and that's like how they know me, they just think I'm that. So right. the, like when I was doing this, people were like, oh, she's like, Real butchy, masculine. Uh, <laughs> she can't play. Yeah, and then they would meet me and be like, "Oh no, you're, you're oh, okay. You're a little oh, different. Actually, I was like, you're very acting. feminine and beautiful." Well, yeah. I honestly, often got that comment when I would go into auditions when I was doing right, big, and I was like, "It's stink." And then with Diana Trout, I'd come in and be gross and schlumpy, and they're like, "Oh, she's not, huh? She's not, you know, as elevated That's- as Diana is." It drives me a little nuts well, when casting people are like, mm, no, she can't. I know. Well, that's I'm the like, curse of the comedian. Like, uh, you know, I, I've acted. I, I, I've always taken acting cl- classes and they're like, well, do you, and it's like, I'm playing a character. I'm not, I'm not the way I, I don't get up in the morning. And I'm like, hey, how's everyone doing this morning? I'm going to make some coffee. Like, <laughs> it's like you got to prove yourself. The better you are at it, the harder it is to convince people you're not that person. Right. And you're like, well, thanks so now I'm being penalized for being good at what I did. <laughs> it's it's a catch-22. Yeah, I hear But it. I, you know, I, I love that. And the people, I, you know, I was on The Americans for a while and I played this yeah, very oh, that's right. serious. I, I had that written, but I was like, I can't do them all. Yeah, I loved it. Yeah. It fun. And people who know me from that were like, oh, does right. she do comedy? And they're like, really? Okay. And then people who know me from the comedy would be like, well, can right. she do the drama? I know. Well, it's uh, like, think out of the fucking box like you do with all the men, okay? Look, if you just give me a shot to try to convince you, I'll be okay. I'm fine auditioning. It's when they're like, no, you don't even get a shot. But I'm like, okay, well, now I'm pissed off. <laughs> no, I'm like, no. I'm getting the signal that we have to wrap up. And I could talk to you forever, but I, can I ask you two more questions that I always ask? I feel like a little bit like um, we're friends that just like hadn't really gotten a chance to hang out yet. Does that make sense? I know. We need to hang out and we you need to come see my hoarding and I need to see your hoarding. We'll be the person that's like, you should definitely keep that. I know it's just a blank slip of paper. but We should do a show <laughs> where it's like, 
we're both trying to de hoard our apartments, and we have the 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 Nazi uh, throw that out, throw that out, and then you're we're here going, don't throw it out, don't throw it out. Oh my god, I see its value. Right? I know it actually looks like trash. So that's a banana peel from the 19. And I can so see why you like need it. it. Yeah. Um, okay. So I asked my podcast guests two things always. One, we're very pro mental health. Um, so what do you do for your mental health? Well, I'll tell you what I do, especially during COVID, but I, it helps me all the time. It's just is walk. I know that yes. sounds weird. And not like hike, but like nine yeah, yeah, miles. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, you tell me to hike and I already hate you. Right. I just like, just walk. Yeah. But I, it saved me. I would walk in circles around like, I just walk. And because as soon as you start ruining your body, and what I would do is walk, and this is like goes hand in hand, and then call someone I want to talk to. Right. H- how long would you walk for? I mean, sometimes I would, I only 15 minutes. I, I'm just going to walk 15 minutes. Like, I just need to walk. I just need to get it's it so going. Healthy. Not, so healthy. It, and it's doable. Anyone can, you know, you or, can or just do- get outside, get whatever you can moving to do that. But, uh, and then talking is just like, connect to someone you love, you know, loves you that can make you laugh or make you whatever, just hear your one sentence you have to say. But I did in fact have moments when I would walk in a circle around a little driveway in this little. I did that too. I, I was just like, I have to get out. And, and yeah. Or they said 20 you. minutes a day is so good for your mental health of just walking. Would you tell me, uh, you have to go to the gym for an hour? I can find every reason in the book not right. to, but just step yeah, outside and walk, and walk for a and couple minutes. And it's good for you. It's good exercise and healthy. Okay, so that's number one. You're a walker, walker, and a talker. Talk to your friend, like anybody. Just call them up. Do you go to therapy? I do, but yeah, that's me too. Different, right? Like you get something yeah, else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. From talking to a friend because you're reminded that you love people. Yeah, and you have a connection. Connection. Yeah. And that, that is something that matters a lot to me and friendship is really yeah. important. So you keep, keep that, that going as much as you can. You're going to think, I don't want to bother them. Whatever. They won't answer. They yeah, don't want to. I know them. we have, you know, it used to be, you had to fucking answer the phone. You didn't know who was on the other end. Like, we'll talk on the phone now. Learn. It's a yeah. good skill. Yeah. Uh, I like that too. So the, how many you need? Three? Cause I got another one. Oh, okay. You can do another one. No, walk, talk, and then like do one small thing for yourself, whatever it is. Like, my yes. Yourself, yes. You come. Because you need to remind yourself that like you love yourself and you matter to yourself. Right. Like meditate or do something. Whatever it is. I don't know. Buy yourself yeah. a pack. No, whatever it is. Doesn't yeah. need to be, again, like you don't need to, it doesn't need to be, to go to a spa for $10,000. We can't all do that. But you know, something that you should remind yourself that you're like, oh, I value myself. Oh, me I too. wouldn't love, I would love that, the $10,000 spa. Okay. Number two. Now, I named the podcast Kill Me Now because if you know me, everything gets on my nerves where I'm like, I can't take it anymore. Like, I, it's a 10. And it's getting worse as I get older. So, and the stupidest things piss me off, but they're not really stupid when I think about them. Like, you know, I mean, the mundane is, you know, like I cannot take the people walking down the street looking at their phone. And then you're walking towards me. And you're not looking and I'm not moving. I'm not moving because you're not fucking paying attention. So I'll put my arms up. I'll go, hello. And my kids get so annoyed with me. Can't you just walk around? No, because they don't own the fucking sidewalk looking at their fucking phone. I'm not adjusting for someone who's not paying attention. Anyway, um, what pisses you off more than anything in the whole world? Uh, I don't like when people are mean. I, oh, I think yeah. people exert energy to be mean sometimes. And I know it comes from fear or insecurity. Blah, 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 blah. They can talk to their therapist about it and spend all that money. I don't need to. I don't, it just takes energy right. to, be, to be mean to people that it makes me crazy though. Like, why? Yeah. What is that? I don't get it. It hurts because it's- you're a miserable fuck who needs attention and a narcissist. And why do you want negative attention? I don't know why it, I, I don't know. And I think we have a sense too that like, you're cool if you're mean and you're like a dumb shit if you're nice. Yeah, you're not. And I'm like, mm, you're not. I, and you know that. that. Yeah, that's people who are too scared to like just be a nice person. And, and we, we assign right, like right. some kind of nice. I don't uh, no. You can be a super because smart they'll person. Fall apart. Yeah, I, I don't like, get you it. You know, Trump is a pro. I mean, he's the meanest person in the world, but like. 
He can't yeah, even take someone like, joking about. He's there's no disarming. You have your armor up, and you're no one wants to be around you. You fucking orange but piece of shit. Stand up comedy. Uh, like when I respond to an amazing stand up comedian, it's because they're so goddamn smart, and they put it in a way that I'm like, ah, oh, oh, that's just so smart that and right. funny. And you got me into this place. Why you crafted you something? You're just an asshole. I'm like, well, right. I didn't do that. You know. Yeah. Show me dexterity. Exactly. I can't do. Not just like being a dick. <laughs> I can do that. Yeah. It's too easy to be a dick. It's too easy. Speaking of dicks, I have to go. Um, I have a meeting and then I'm going to go. I'm going to go pick it. Have you been picketing? For I the Writers had, Guild? I've been doing the press stuff. So I'm, yeah. Are you kidding? I'm from Detroit and I'm in three England. For Galaxy of the Galaxy of the Guardians of the Galaxy of the Galaxy of the Guardians. This is the real deal. It's a liable movie. Um, yeah, fuck yeah, yeah, I'm gonna pick it. I mean, all right, well, let me know, you know, get my number thing from Laura because I sign up on the Writers Guild thing and we could go to one together. Fantastic. Yeah, I mean, I have it from SAG. I'm also in the DJ because I'm a director as well. Oh, that's right. You did direct some younger episodes, younger episodes. Okay, I'm sick of you with all your accomplishments, Miriam. I'm just happy that I got to meet you and that now we're actually friends. Okay, we are totally hanging out. Happening. I'm not kidding because you know I have made friends from the podcast. Good, that's a good reason to have a podcast. Yes, yeah. And you live in New York City, and you are such a star. Mazel tov on everything. Uh, Guardians of the Galaxy is going to be fucking. It's just amazing. You are amazing. I can't wait for uh, Maestro. Maestro. I can't. I just. You're great. You're so great, and you're such a delight. And I can't thank you enough. Well, I'm rubber, your glue, as and the same. I'm terms. stuck on you? No, yeah. well, I'm rubber, your glue. Everything you say bounces off me. Sticks to you. And, okay, I'm in. Thank you so much for listening to Kill Me Now, uh, part two of my interview with Miriam Shore. I hope you enjoyed. Kill Me Now is produced by Laura Vogel, edited by Colin Schmeling, and marketed and everything else by the incredible Brittany Jo Sowards Richmond. We just want to give a shout out to Brittany. Brittany, um, unfortunately, her father passed pretty suddenly a couple of weeks ago, and uh, we wish her and her family uh, well and deepest condolences. He was a young guy, David Sowards, and just for everything I've read about him, a great guy. A really great guy and upstanding citizen and apparently a good father because Brittany's pretty amazing. So, um, and beloved, beloved in his community in West Virginia. So rest in peace. Uh, I, I don't even know why I did that. They're so Christian. I don't even know why I hit that. Okay, whatever. Well, his name's David, so that's... You know, David was Jewish. Uh, so let me tell you about my upcoming dates. Let me tell you about it now. I am going to be at the Gordon Center for Performing Arts in Maryland, in Owings Mills, Maryland, uh, on June 22nd. So get your asses there. It's right by Baltimore. Then I go to, uh, I'm opening at the Post Office Cafe and Cabaret in Provincetown on the 25th. My show, Everything Hurts Everywhere All at Once. Get it? (laughs) Uh, And I'm going to be at the Montreal Comedy Festival uh, in mid-July between the 18th and 28th. Uh, So please come see me. Uh, Oh, I do. Oh, I don't even have my phone. I, I did take pictures of everyone who was saying that you know that they listen to the end so if you're listening to the end please let me know because i'm i'm happy to to mention you I, I i love when you people write to me it's just it makes me feel so good because as you know someone actually said just go to patreon so you can make some money but then it's a whole big small sh- sh- gingle small sh- gingle I, I made that up i i do this for the love And that comes from you because I'm needy and I'm comedian and we want people to love us. So whatever love you can send my way, I so appreciate it. What else? Uh, I don't know. I don't know what else. I hope you enjoy this week's episode. Next week, a lot to talk about. A lot to talk about. I really thank you. Thank you all for listening. And as we always say, and I want to say 
that this airs on the um, 14th. Does it air on the 14th? No, it airs on the 13th of June. And my mother's yort site, which is the anniversary of her death uh, on the Jewish calendar, is actually on Sunday night at sundown, but she died on June 15th, uh, 2015. And I'm telling you, it's like yesterday. So if you have your mother and if you have your father, you are one lucky son of a bitch. Wait, I'm checking to see if I have the date wrong of my mother's. Uh, oh, no, he, she died on June 17th. June 17th. I'm sorry. So the anniversary is, I don't know why I always think it's the 15th. Oh, you know, the 15th, you know why? Because that was the last day I saw her was June 15th, 2015. I went to visit her. Yeah, so it's, uh, you know, the anniversaries are hard. They're hard. It's hard every day. But it's so interesting because I think about her a lot during this time. And when I was in Israel, I just wanted to call her uh, and tell her all this stuff. And I kept thinking, oh, I got to call her. And then you just get it. You're like, no, you can't. So it's it's kind of hard. So if you have your parents... Seriously, you are so lucky and tell them you love them. Uh, And I don't know. I think that's it. I am thrilled that whoever's listening right now, I fucking love you more than anything. And thank you for all your love and support. And in honor of my mother, in memory of my mother, I'm going to do a very special goodbye. I am going to do so long exactly the way she said it. Okay, ready? Thank you so much for listening. And we, as we always say, so long.